uh, it is good this morning, then, as we uh, turn to our scripture, that we hear a story about one and then more who made a difference. I read to you from John chapter 6, uh, verses 1 through 14. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. And when he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one of them to get even a little. One of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here. There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now, there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. And then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. And when the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh God, uh, we give you thanks for this story, for your living word that today reminds us that in you, all of our gifts are made more than enough. Open us. Open our hearts and our heads and our hands to the truth of your word this morning. Amen. This particular story of the feeding of the 5,000 is told in all four Gospels. And that's kind of unusual, actually. Not, um, not all stories, in fact, very few stories are told in all four Gospels. And so I think that tells us that in this early church and for the early Christian writers, evangelists, and missionaries, that this was a must-be-told event, right? We want everybody to know this. This This is really, really important. As the gospel writer John tells us, this happens right after Jesus is called out by Jewish leaders for healing on the Sabbath. As I've said before, it's really important when we're reading scripture that we know where a particular story comes from because what happens before and after usually gives us insight into that story. So what we're just told at the end of chapter 5, and just hear this verse, uh, 518, for this reason, leaders of the Jews were seeking all the more to kill Jesus because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but was also calling God his father, thereby making himself equal to God. So what we know before this takes place is that Jesus was very aware that there were those out to kill him. This is a death threat on your life. Hmm. And so it appears then for this reason that Jesus was, was drawing away. Um, that... Uh, The first verse I read there in 6, after this, after knowing about the death threats, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. You can get it, right? Like, I need to get away. The disciples went with him. Let's regroup. Um, Let's renew. Let's get set. And so they get over there. And if you might have heard this story before, you know what happens. When they get there, there are already people There are already people there. Um, They were not alone. We're told the large crowd 
kept following him because the, they saw the signs he was doing for the sick. They saw the signs he was doing for the sick. There were a real, as in our day, there was a real need for physical healing. We've heard all these stories about who Jesus has healed. Uh, the leper, uh, the woman hemorrhaging, the paralyzed, the blind, the lame. If you had heard that someone had done that, right, you, you would go or you would take your family member. If you knew that there was someone healing, Pittsburgh, Erie, Buffalo, San Francisco, Miami, you go because you have heard that what? Cancer was healed, COVID was healed, heart disease, whatever you have, whatever your loved one has, completely healed. So this urgency of this crowd to be with Jesus, no matter what, no matter where. And so we're told in this scripture that Jesus sees them coming toward him, right? My reaction, maybe your reaction would be, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? We can't get away for like half a day. I can't take my Sabbath rest. And then the question comes up. Because Jesus knows these people, right, are needy, are hungry, like we would be. They're, they followed him. And he says, where are we going to buy bread for them to eat? Where will we get enough for them to eat? And we're told in John, which doesn't come up in the other scripture, but we're told in John that he said this because he already knew what he was going to do. He cared about their physical well-being. Now, Philip, who is a good disciple, right? He's a good disciple, like maybe you and I are good disciples, says, six months' wages isn't even enough, Jesus. That's not good. We can't feed them, right? That seems logical, right? We can't feed them. But then there's Andrew. And I really, um, I think it's so interesting here that he's identified as Simon Peter's brother. So if you've ever been identified as someone's something, you might have a little bit of a feel for Andrew here. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, um, he offers this up. Hey, there's a boy here, you know. Um, there's a boy here who has five... Um, Five fish and two, wait a minute, I'm always getting my, my, I'm going back to where he has two loaves and five fish or five loaves and two fish. I always get that confused. But he's got a small meal. He's got a small meal. But then he goes, but what would that do, right? Have you ever had an idea that you actually thought was kind of a good idea, but you're afraid to say it, right? So you're kind of like, but what do you think? That won't do any good. Right, Jesus? You know, envision him like, right, Jesus? There's a boy here. I want to give a shout out to Andrew, all by his lonesome, without any additional phrasing, that he was paying attention. Right? Andrew is the one in this story that was paying attention, and he noticed what? A child. He noticed a child. Think of all the stories where someone has noticed a child. Noticed a child in need, or in here, noticed a child who has something. Jesus responds, you heard it, make the people sit down. Right? And they're all like, okay, <laughs> okay. all right, we'll do it. And, and so it's, we're told there's a big open space. We're a big open space, and all the people sit down. And then in that moment, that to us in the church maybe sounds like the blessing at communion. It's not, but that's the feel to it. It says Jesus took that bread and, right, can't, I can feel it. And blessed it. And he broke it. And he passed it out. And we're told that it's not just that everyone got a crumb, but that everyone got as much as they wanted. Everybody was filled. There was more than enough. And then Jesus says, gather up all the fragments left over so that nothing might be lost. And they gathered 12 filled baskets of just the leftovers. And then the people went, wow. Wow. This is a prophet. Hmm. This is a clear story in terms of message, at least 
on one level. When we offer what we have, as little as it might be, to Christ's work in the world, God will make it not just enough, but more than enough. That may be your take home for today. When we offer, like the boy, when we offer what little we might have, whatever that means to you, to Christ's work in the world, God will make it enough. When our hearts and heads and hands are open to possibilities. So who's the hero, heroes in our story this morning? Of course, Jesus and Andrew. Like I said, the one who was paying attention. The one who seemed to be thinking outside the box. The one you'd want on your team when you're doing brainstorming. And the boy. There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. Maybe he had held it up. Maybe he had held it out first. We don't know. We don't know if it was offered or if he was asked, but we do know that this small amount offered by a child opened up the possibility for a miracle. Now, we don't know what actually happened, right? Scripture gives us way less details than most of us would like. We don't know what actually happened in that moment or how that bread and fish got to be so much for so many. But some scholars propose this. Some scholars propose that the miracle was that when the crowd saw Jesus blessing that boy's small offering, they were moved to share what they had previously hid. Carried in a cloth, tucked in a pocket of a tunic, a loaf of bread, a handful of figs or olives, some dried fish of their own, something they were hold on to in case they needed it. And a miracle. And the miracle occurred that when Jesus offered that bread, gave thanks for it, and broke it, hearts were broken open. And the hands were opened up. Rather than grasping tight on what they had, their hands were opened up when they shared, which turned out there was enough for everybody. Is that a miracle? I think so. You might be familiar with uh, the story Stone Soup, which I have read on numerous occasions here at the church, about the soldiers who come to the town and they're hungry and all the villagers are afraid, and so they, they hide all their food. And then the soldiers suggest that they know how to make soup from stones. And they ask for a fire to be built and a big kettle and a pot of water. And they add stones. And as it heats, each of the soldiers uh, starts to say, you know what would be really good if we had some carrots for this? Oh, yes, I have carrots. And so the different village people go and they gather up um, vegetables and finally meat. And the stew is cooked and in the end, the entire village eats this delicious dinner, and the soldiers are invited to stay overnight. And then they say, and to think, this all started with stones. Hmm. Now, that book, that story, that fable, it's trickery, really, um, involved in that story that gets the people to share. But I want to say about this story this morning, it's love. It's the love and presence of Jesus. It's the blessing that opens up these people's lives to sharing. The 2020 census tells us about our own nation, that 38 million Americans live in households that struggle with food insecurity. That is almost 12% of the population of our nation um, lives with food insecurity. Internationally, something like 820 million people are malnourished. Too big. We can't do anything about that, right? It's that 5,000, that's that 5,000 people idea. What, how are we going to feed these people, Jesus? Actually, we can't. 
We can't feed them all. But like this story goes, we can feed some. We can start giving what we have because that's what the story says. Jesus says, give me what you got. Give me what you've got and I will make it enough. Together, working with Jesus, we have enough. So that's what we're doing today, right? With the soup that's been donated and the cookies donated by all of our soup makers and cookie bakers, by donations given here um, to support local food pantries, by the work that those of you here in the church and in the community do for the soup kitchen, for all the ways that we have through United Methodist Committee on Relief reached out in this world to address hunger internationally, we're on it. We're on it. And so on a day when you think, I don't think I have enough. I don't think I have enough for today. Energy, time, financial resources, whatever. I want you and me to trust that with uh, all gifts, all lives given to Jesus, it is more than enough.